pelvis. Like our accommodation size is going to vary between pelvis, hip, and femur. SID will be universally 40 inches this chapter, which is really nice. ID markers, what do y'all think I'm going to say about that? Y'all should know by now. <laughs> Anatomical markers, only some of the time, right? When it's convenient, affordable, and I forget it in the department. That's after we get a license. <laughs> after you get a license. Hey, you know, I can't stop you, but you know, the ghost of Donahue Pass will be haunting you. Use those anatomical markers, Jones. We'll be floating over your head. Uh, rad protection is going to be a little variable as well between male and female patients because of the area we are dealing with. And of course, our patient instructions just tell them what we're doing and why we're doing it and being very detailed on that. So, there are some very important artifacts to talk about here. Very similar when we went over the abdominal chapter. What do y'all think I'm going to refer to here? Well, what's the first bullet point? What are undergarments? That's your underwear. And so many texts, and um, they, they don't want to remove it. And they are afraid to ask the patient to do so. Let me tell you, though, that is going to affect your images quite a bit, especially when we're talking about that digital technology again, because it picks up all those small fibers, elasticity bands jewelry, whatever they're wearing on their undergarments, it's gonna show up. So as a general practice guys, especially now in our digital age, you need to ask the patients to remove all clothing from the waist down, including your undergarments. And use the word undergarments. It's very the same, take your underwear off. You don't wanna just walk up to patients, hey, take your underwear off and lay on the table. They're gonna look at you like you've lost your mind and probably say, well, that person's a creepo and why well, they want me to take my underwear off? Because a lot of techs don't do it and they're probably used to people not telling them to do it. But you justify why. I need you to remove all your undergarments from the waist down, including your underwear, so that we can see everything in the area of interest on the x-ray. That way you already answered their question and say, well, why? Because I want to be able to see everything in that area of interest. That makes sense? To specify why you're doing it. Clothing, um, provide, you know, please provide a gown. Don't throw them up there without any clothes on. Uh, some people I've worked with. Double gown, by the way. You know, especially in the winter, you know, it's really cold. Hospital's already cold. Don't have their bum exposed. Give them two gowns, front and back, for modesty, uh, modesty purposes and for warmth. Give them a sheet as well to keep them warm on that. But make sure everything's off. It's going to help you out a lot. Um, especially that fancy underwear. It shows up on the logos, all that stuff. It shows up. It all shows up. Pink, yeah, that one right there. Pink. I've had that show up on so many x-rays. Yes, yes. Nike. I've seen all kinds of stuff. Victoria's Secret. I saw what Victoria's Secret was. The secret is it shows up on x-rays. <laughs> oh, that was a good joke. Y'all can laugh at that one. I worked hard on that joke. Come on. I laughed. That's a lie. That's a question that should be a Monday joke. Every, every day is a different issue. This Monday, it's Friday, it's Wednesday. <laughs> All right, so. For all these x-rays, everything we're doing in this chapter is going to be supine. There should be no reason we ever do this any other way but supine. Unless they come in like on their side or something, then we'll do it across table. But everything should be done preferably supine. We're not going to stand up for any of these. There's no weight-bearing views that we're going to talk about. And of course, common sense guys, proper transfer techniques. Use grid IRs for all these positions. If you're doing this portably, and I know every tech you work with does this, I say this sarcastically, you should use a grid because the area we are ex I just saw you with that thing on your head. I'm sorry, Charo. <laughs> Made me that was, that was funny looking. It's cold in here. Um, because the area we are x raying, guys, the hip area of the pelvis is very thick. Very thick. Lots to penetrate. We need a grid to reduce what? Oh, reduce scatter okay. and improve well, image quality. If I don't use a grid, what is my image going to suffer from? The spatial resolution is going to be compromised. It's going to get very what? Noisy. Noisy, thank you. <laughs> noisy, not foggy, but noisy. That's a registry question, by the way. It's a really important concept. The lack noisy of these the first two? Right so, huh? Noisy the first two? Noisy. So low spatial resolution will equal noise or pixelation on the image. And we mitigate that by using a grid. It's going to give it a smoother, higher spectral resolution, better look. Very important concept. Um, God, there's something else I was going to say on that. I, my brain is not working today. It is Friday. Cool. Wow. How's your coffee this morning? It's pretty good. 
Oh, it's Starbucks coffee. This is not a, I ran out of the other one. It's the Holiday Blend. I don't really like their Holiday Blend this year. It's not that good. They change it up every year. I'm not really keen on this one this year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's overly priced, overpriced. Play that That's why I buy my own. I buy my own <laughs> Starbucks coffee. I buy it at Sounds because you get the giant bag for like 20 bucks. Just make your own Starbucks coffee. You know? Sure. I like Dutch Bros. I don't live near one. I've never tried that. I haven't had that either. All right. So all of our exposures in this chapter, guys, we're gonna suspend respiration. Please write that down. Do not choose expiration on your test. We are suspending respiration. So Just tell them to stop, button. breathe, don't move, don't breathe. We're not telling them to blow out and hold it out. We're saying don't move, don't breathe. Suspend that respiration. That's for every position in this chapter. size so if we're dealing with the pelvis it's always going to be a 14 by 17 cassette that's your average adult patient the only reason you would ever alter that is of course if you have a child but in general we should always have 14 by 17 and let me say on the pelvis you should always be doing this crosswise why do you think that is it's a wide area hips are wide some wider on others but hips are wide don't try to do that lengthwise. It's not going to work out for you. You end up cutting off the sides of the hips, sides of the pelvis, or sides of the femurs. Now for the hip, we are going to do a 10 by 12 cassette for both projections, AP and lateral. For the AP, that should be lengthwise. It is going to change. Right finger right down for the star by. AP is going to be lengthwise. Lateral is going to be crosswise. We are going to switch those between. Reason being, think about it, when I'm laying AP, I'm interested in the fem femoral area. Lengthwise would make sense. Crosswise, I'm going to end up cutting off femur. I'll have enough of it on there. When I do a lateral, you remember how you did your laterals? You do this, mm -hmm. you know what I'm talking about? It goes to the side, right? Mm -hmm. So I need to do it crosswise to get that femur on there once again. We talked about the hip. We're talking about the combination of the pelvis and the femur together. They're both the start of the show, that x-ray. Um, acetabulum, we do acetabulum views, or what we call Jude views. French word for you, Jude. Um, 10 by 12 cassettes. And then for our interior pelvic bones, it's going to be our inlet and outlet views. We're going to use 14 by 17s again, crosswise on both of those. Those are going to be our specialized views we talk about. And once again, all of these should either be in the bucky or with a grid because it's a thick area of penetration. When you're doing portables for abdomen, you should, yes. Um, I know you see that all the time, right? And, and the chest, right? So it's chest, abdomen. Chest, it's yeah. optional, but okay. abdomen should be required just because of how thick that area is. Okay. I don't, now I know what I was going to tell y'all, talking about the grids, because this, this is a great concept. I think I've already asked y'all this, but I want to hammer it into this. Will show up on your registry. Do grids reduce patient exposure? Yes or no? Are they used to help lower dose and protect the patient? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm hearing both answers. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm asking this question. Mm -hmm. yes. I'm gonna stand up. No. Do the grids reduce patient dose? No. Yeah, but it's outside the patient. No. Think about it. What's the primary purpose of using a grid? Oh, to oh, reduce scatter. Oh, scatter on the IR. To reduce scatter. When we use a grid, what do we do with the with the um, technique, we crank it up. So is dose going up or down? Dose is actually going up. And that's a very common confusion that, I mean, I feel like I struggled with this in school. because you think grid, it just seems like a protective measure. It seems like something you're doing to protect the patients. But make note, I mean, I would write down seven times till you get it because they're gonna ask this on your registry. A grid does not reduce patient dose. It's only for improving image quality to reduce, quality, to reduce scatter radiation. It's only for the purposes of increasing quality. And then if you, if you don't use it, then, then you have to retake it. Like, I think we took that five times. Like, 
What's its primary purpose? Is it not to reduce dose, it's to clean up the image. Grid doesn't reduce the Grid does not reduce dose. It actually increases dose, but it improves the image quality. I swear people miss that every year when we start reviewing that. All right, there's an easy concept right there, guys. What did I say about the SID? Three inches. Please don't select 72. Please don't select 60. Please don't select 30. That'd be your other three answer choices, by the way. 40 inches only. What's the, um, speaking It's not just chest. I mean, there's quite a few. Like, AC joints. AC joints, chest, sternum if you want to put it in there, lateral C spine. That's next semester. There's a few others. So currently, just from what we know, that we've already tied is just chest and AC joints. Yes. All right, guys. I know it. I mean, every chapter, we should know this like the back of our hand by now. We're going to avoid using digital annotation. Every time, and use our physical anatomical markers. Oh, they didn't let me use my markers when um, I was in there with the ladies. I'm shopping. He was just bleeding all over. Like, uh, they were, they, I was trying to put it on his But what if your registry says the man's bleeding everywhere? Should you use digital markers? Of course, I'm going to say yes because I was trying to put my hand on his Okay, I'm just making sure. I just listened to them. I was just wondering have you ever been in a what? case where there was you, digital markers? No. You, no, you're never, 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 never going to use digital markers, period. <laughs> per the curriculum in the registry, it doesn't matter how fancy they make that question look, they might say someone's like standing on their head upside down at an obtuse angle and there's blood <laughs> and feces everywhere. I don't know, I'm just throwing words out there. Do you use digital markers? No. You still use physical markers every time. You just put your marker they'll, in there. They'll, they'll make it look fancy and try to throw you off. Yeah. All right, for rat protection, guys, we're still going to utilize our close collimation as much as possible. Now, with the, the pelvis, typically that's just going to be wide open because the pelvis is going to fill the entire facet. But things like the hip and the femur, we can go ahead and close that collimation down, protect our patients and improve image quality. And we should still be using that gonad shielding as needed, according to the state regulations, to reduce patient anxiety and if it's not going to cover up the area of interest. So, in that case, it is required, I think I already said this, it's required to shield male patients on hip and pelvis, but it's optional for females. Mm. That sounds really discriminatory. Um, reason being, most of your facilities do not provide the proper ovarian shields, because you have to think about where the sex organs are located. For the male, they ping below the pelvis. Females, they're in the middle of the pelvis. Therefore, you have to use a specialized ovarian shield, but you have to get it just right inside the pelvic brim Otherwise, you obscure pelvic anatomy and you have to repeat the image. So that's why for females, they actually consider it almost a safer practice to not use it because you're shooting blinds and hoping that you cover it up without covering up the pelvis. Does that make sense? So optional for females, required for males. Same thing for abdomens, by the way. And for proximal femur as well? Yes. Well, proximal femur, you can, you can go ahead and shield because that's, you're not concerned about the hip or the pelvis at all. It's just femur. That's a different, that's a different. Mm -hmm. Like side of it. Yeah. All right, let's just review again, guys. But you're always explaining everything. Everything is as far as respiration goes. We're going to suspend that for our exposure. We're suspending respiration. We're not taking it on expiration. It's different from an abdomen. You make note of that. We're suspending respiration. So, in other words, don't move, don't breathe. All right, let's start going over some of these procedures. We're going to start with the pelvis itself. And, I'm sorry, we're starting with the femur. I lied to you. We're going backwards here. So, this looks like that old PowerPoint from the last chapter because it's from it. I had to splice <laughs> it over to this one. We're going to go over our femoral projections of AP and lateral. 
I hate doing femur x-rays. One of my least favorite x-rays. I don't know why, but I've always hated doing these x-rays. I think it's because you have to always do the upper and lowers. And I don't know. Not my favorite x-ray to do. Let's start with the AP, guys. Now, it says if the femur is too long to fit on one IR, this is going to be most of your patients. doesn't matter how short or tall they are. For the most part, you're going to have to do an upper and lower unless they're just extremely small or a child. So if it's too long to fit, which is most of the time, we're including the joint closest to the area of interest. So for the upper femur, what joint are we including? The hip. For lower femur, we're including the knee joint. Knee joint. And you always want to make sure you have overlap between the two. Now, when you're in lab, how do, he, how do they show you to do the overlap? Do you use your fingers? Mm. Yes or no? This is like so for the lower, um, sorry, for the distal femur, just um, I guess just right below the knee. Correct. Joint. And then for the proximal femur, it was at the, the top of the line at the axis. Correct. Well, let me show you what I always did. This is, what I, this is how I learned in school because you do have to have sufficient overlap and you have some people with some really long legs. Like I have a long femur bone, so you would risk cutting off the midsection if you're not careful. So I would always take my first x-ray upper, I'll put my fingers on the lower portion here, mm -hmm. and as I move my patient, I'll make sure my fingers stay within the light field. Mm -hmm. If my fingers are still within the light field, I have overlap. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Mm -hmm. so as I move that light lower, I'm making sure my fingers are staying within the light field. If they're outside the light field, I know I'm cutting something off. Can you do that on this side? So that we couldn't really see. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so I put my fingers right here. And as I move the light down towards the knee, I make sure my fingers stay within the light field the whole time. Okay. And that tells me that I still have overlap <coughs> between two x-rays. So if you have someone with a really long leg, that's very important. That's the little thing I learned in school. Like, that's, like for that picture specifically, that's a lot of overlap. Like, that's like the whole and it's going to be for some people. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. But like I said, yes, we do with some really long legs. That's going to be a lot more uh, efficient, in my opinion. All right, so this is going to be the lower right here. So this is called the AP femur lower or AP femur with knee included. So the affected thigh, we're going to have that centered. We are going to internally rotate the extremity slightly. Reason being, we need to place the femoral epicondyles parallel with the IR. That's a great question right there. We're going to slightly internally rotate the extremity using just by turning the foot excuse me to place those femoral epicondyles parallel with the IR and just like y'all said bottom of the IR or the light will be approximately two inches below the knee so you need that entire knee joint not just the top part the entire knee joint so there will be some tip fib on there that's okay Why was this different from the other picture that was also AP female? We're talking about the different parts. We're starting with the lower here. I just show you both together, upper and lower. We're talking about the lower positioning, then we're going to talk about the upper positioning separate. And there it is right there. There's the second one, the upper. So this was lower. Now we're going to do the upper or hip included. Same thing, guys. We're putting the affected thigh center to the IR. Top of the IR approximately at the as is. If you go above the as is, it's too high. You don't want to go above the as is. And we are going to have an actual degree of rotation of the extremity for this one. You'll notice on the previous slide, it does not give you an actual range. It was using to slightly turn the leg. But for this one, you need to do it at least 10 to 15 degrees. 10 to 15 degrees internally to place the femoral necks in profile. It's another very important bullet point there. We're going to start, we're going to internally rotate the extremity 10 to 15 degrees, place the femoral next in the profile. Correct. So the previous one, we're putting the femoral epicondyles parallel with the IR. For the upper, we're turning the leg to place the femoral next in profile. A little bit different between the two. But it's, it's all about what's the start of the show that x ray that you might focus on. Mm -hmm. On the upper, I want to hit femoral neck. Okay. Lower, I want to hit the dials. <coughs> <coughs> Mm 
So to answer one of y'all's questions about shielding, so for a female patient, you know, you can put a shield on this side over here. You still don't want the light filled, but if you just go to the side of the light here, you can at least shield some of the ovaries on a female patient. Mm -hmm. One of the ovaries, rather, not some. One, one of the ovaries, mm -hmm. only two. Unless she's a creature. An alien. Uh, yeah, it's a, that is a very rare condition. You can have multiple ovaries. Mm -hmm. you know, too. It's like you can have what's called a bicornate uterus. You have two uteruses. Mm. Have you ever seen that? I have. Yeah. I've, seen both some, I've seen some weird stuff. So both are, both are functional? Both are functional, yes. Mm -hmm. Technically, yes. <laughs> you know, there, there's very, you can look this up, it's a true story. There are rare cases, not necessarily because of a bicornate uterus, but maybe think about this. There was this really funny story. I've seen this happen on different accounts where a woman got pregnant and a few months later she got pregnant again. So she gave birth to two babies different times, even though she carried them both the same time. Like, y'all follow me? Like she, she had a baby growing for about two months, then mm -hmm. she got pregnant again, and another baby started growing. Very rare occurrence, but that can't happen. Anyway, long story short, she gives birth to both babies. The first baby looks like the mom and dad. The second baby is like a different race. Oh, that's so, so you are not she, she got caught cheating. She got caught cheating with another man. She got pregnant with another man while she had the original husband's baby growing because too. Because she didn't think she was good. Yeah. True story, by the way. Yeah. It's happened on multiple. Oh, very rare. But it's happened on multiple accounts. That that's a very rare thing. That's good. So that's that's gotta be awkward. That's gonna be awkward. Poor oh. kid. <laughs> If you don't think it can happen, it can happen. There's all kinds of weird occurrences that can happen. You just never know. Anyway, that's a good bonus question, too. Uh, Who should you call? For both views, both views, guys, we're going to be perpendicular to the mid femur. For both views, perpendicular to the mid femur. And we are including the entire femur along with the hip joints or the knee joint, depending on which portion we are visualizing. So here's what we see here, guys, based on turning those legs we just talked about. You have the epicondyles parallel on the lower, femoral neck in profile on the upper. If you want to know what that little dot is, that's an osteoma on the bone. It's bone cancer. So the image to the left is the internal rotation? Or are they both internal? They're both internal. Okay. It's slight on the lower, 10 to 15 on the upper. Oh, okay, so it's just like a degree or two. Like you just barely turn the foot on the lower. Because you gotta think of how the femur sits. Your epicondyles will be oblique. We don't slightly turn the foot. By the way, guys, make notes. Just because we have passed this chapter, we're still talking about some this anatomy. So knee anatomy. If you have trouble with that knee anatomy, make sure you review it because you can still be asked that. Those epicondyles, those condyles, those interchondral eminence, tibial plateaus, base apex patella, proximal tibial joint, lots of stuff there. All right. So evaluation criteria, guys, we want most of the femur and joint nearest the pathologic condition or site of injury. In other words, if I'm doing lower, I want the entire knee joint. If I'm doing upper, I want the entire hip joint. Fancy way of saying that. We want the femoral neck to not be foreshortened. How do we achieve this? We're rotating the foot 10 to 15 degrees internally to put the femoral neck in profile and to reduce foreshortening, elongate it essentially. We also do not want the lesser trochanter to be seen beyond the medial border. That tells us that we did not rotate the leg, by the way. And we're gonna find that out with our hip and pelvis x-rays. If we're not turning the leg, we can tell very quickly on an x-ray because that lesser trochanter will be poking out quite a bit. We want it to be as hidden as possible on the femoral shaft. 
no, re, no knee rotation. We do that by slightly rotating the foot, once again, on the leg. And if there is an appliance, we want the, the orthopedic appliance in its entirety. We always want the entire appliance. So obviously there's little adjustments they have to make to the centering when they have an actual piece of hardware in their leg. They want the entire appliance. So um, that can be very difficult if you're doing a femur x-ray and it's going down the entire femur. You may need to use a machine that allows the stitching. Have y'all seen some x-rays with stitching? Like a scoliosis x-ray, long bone survey. They can stitch two images together and make them into one. It's an advanced software on some machines. The femur being so long, that might be necessary on some of those. All right, I'll just show you some of that anatomy, guys. Of course, do not forget your knee anatomy, like I just said. It's not all on that image. Make sure you review those epicondyles versus condyles. Remember, epicondyles on the edge, condyles on the interior, circular area here. Those tibial plateaus, intercondylar eminence, and two parts of the patella. The top part's called the what? Yeah, the top base, part, the top base. of the patella. It's called the, the base. Top, so. top of the patella, the base, yeah. the bottom's the what? Apex. Apex. Apex, thank you. And then of course, acetabulum, we've already reviewed that. Femoral head, the neck, there's that greater trochanter. See how that lesser trochanter is barely poking out there? That's okay, it means we can turn the leg inward. If this was poking out way out here, that would tell us that the legs are lax. It's not been internally rotated. You do not want to see much of that lesser trochanter, even though we will see it barely. You can't completely eliminate it with some people. They're uh, different sizes on different people. And of course, your femoral body or shaft, See right here. What was this thing right here, by the way? Ischial tuberosity. Yeah, ischial tuberosity. Do not forget that. Okay, what's that little hole there called? Very good. All right, let's go to our lateral femur. So, of course, we should be turning towards our affected side. Now, on this one, be careful because you can see in this picture. See how she has that leg over, kind of like I taught y'all for knees. Think about this lower as a knee x-ray because we are including the knee so i do suggest you bring this leg over just like you see here but when you go to the upper we got a problem you see what i'm talking about if i'm going to do a proximal lateral femur can i do the leg like this i cannot because it's superimposed so i need to relax the leg behind the affected limb so you can opt to not do this at all i recommend you still bring the leg over because it's going to give you a better lateral knee but just keep in mind if you bring the leg over like this you need to move it back for the proximal or you're going to cut off that hip joint. All right, so we're going to place the unaffected extremity in front of the affected extremity for support. And this is talking about the distal once again that we're focused on. We're going to flex that knee about 45 degrees. And this will, please put a star on that, place those epicondyles perpendicular to the tabletop. They'll superimpose, be perpendicular. So just like the knee guys in the AP, epicondyles are parallel. Lateral epicondyles are perpendicular. Don't forget that. You know, they're superimposed on top of each other in that lateral view, so they're perpendicular to the IR. So, I mean, is this the left leg? This is the left leg. So they don't turn left? They turn right? Oh, it's the right leg, I'm sorry. It's the right leg. So should be the other one? Yeah. If that's the right? That's the right leg. So the right leg down. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's, that's the left leg crossed over. Like if this goes back and she's on her back, see it? Yeah, she's like side, over yeah. that way. <laughs> and that's what I was talking about, guys. When you do the proximal portion, you want to bring the leg back on the other side so that you're not on top of that joint. So look at the difference here. See? See, we're moving the leg. <laughs> that's how you want to do it. A little animation there. Pretty cool. <laughs> whoop, 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 whoop. Sorry, I'm going to try to take pictures. All right, IR is going to be in the same spot, guys. We're going to put the top of the IR at the level of the as is. You don't want to go higher than that. You're going to get a whole bunch of pelvis. That's not the area of interest. We're interested in the femur here. Draw the unaffected extremity posteriorly for support. 
and we will adjust the pelvis slightly so we're rolled approximately 10 to 15 degrees. That will put the uh, proximal femur and hip joint in a lateral position. Adjusting the pelvis 10 to 15 degrees. You don't want them laying supine, it's not going to work out so well. We'll make sure it's in a nice true lateral. Central ray perpendicular to the mid femur, that's for the proximal and the distal. <coughs> Proximal to include hip joint, distal to include knee joint. Did y'all learn a little trick with the hip, by the way, like with the crease? Mm -hmm. so, yeah. We'll go over that in a little bit. You said that was the tech way. It works a lot better. It works, it works a lot better. You show do bend that leg. Yeah. If they can, of course. Yeah, if they can. <laughs> it's not a joint, you don't want to be doing that. <laughs> Oh, this, oh, this is no, for yeah, I, I, was, I was jumping ahead for oh, him because yeah. the lateral hip is kind of similar. You can help me with the crease. Like right here. Yeah, you can like, yeah, the crease. Like I'm sorry, I was jumping ahead. I'm not talking about hip yet. This is still female. Well, we just talked about the same thing. Well, what is perpendicular? So she was like, oh, yeah. All right, so. What are we looking at, guys? Of course, same thing, guys. We're looking at both the hip joint and the knee joint and the entirety of the femoral shaft, these x-rays. The entire length of that femur. Uh, most of the joints, well, it says most of the femur and joint, all the joints. Here's point of interest. If there's an appliance, once again, you need the appliance in its entirety, those x-rays. And do take note on how this anatomy does change between the lateral and the AP, especially on the proximal portion here, guys. Look. So if you think back for the AP, we can see that greater trochanter and profile on the side here. Mm -hmm. But now that we're rolling into a lateral, what's the start of the show? The lesser. The lesser. So in AP, the greater trochanter is in profile. Mm -hmm. In lateral, the lesser trochanter is in profile. I can't talk this morning. Kind of like how with the humerus, you would change which two rossi you were looking at. But the mm -hmm. same concept for the femur. Except we're focusing on the trochanters. Okay. Yeah. So for AP, the lesser has to be superimposed? As much as possible. It won't always be completely superimposed, but you want the greater trochanter to be jutting out and lesser to be as much as you can hide it. Okay. Hidden as much as you can. All right, evaluation criteria with the knee guys. We want the superimposed anterior surface of the femoral condyles. Patella in profile and that open patella femoral space. Very similar to a knee x-ray. Very similar to including the shaft of the femur as well. But look at this image here. Are we in true lateral? No. Yes or no? No. How do you know that? The joint is not so. See how the condoms are separated here? Mm -hmm. Likely they did not bring that leg over this one. Superimposed as possible in that nice space between the patella and the femur right here. That's what we're looking for. Why does it say open patella femur space when it, that's why you use space? Like so? It's because this is not positioned very well. It's a bad x ray. And there's our AP. What are we looking for that one, guys? Greater trochanter will now be superimposed, and a lesser trochanter will be visualized. It's the two main things we're looking for on this one. Greater trochanter, superimposed. Lesser trochanter, visible, or as we say, in profile. Profile. You okay, Jones? Yeah. Struggles real this morning? <laughs> <laughs> We're just so tired, we're all like propping our heads up. Mm -hmm. Where I look, if you want to better fall asleep. It's so hard to wake up in the morning when it's cold outside. Yeah. It is. I it's supposed to be cold rainy tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Luckily, tomorrow is Saturday. <laughs> but I gotta work. Yeah, gotta work. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's take our first break, guys. It's 9.05. Go ahead and take 